Good morning, everybody. This is sharing about a time of deep darkness and also a time of the death of Christ, but also a time of people recognizing what had happened and repentance and a time of entering in, having access into the holiest place of all, into a relationship with God. So let me go ahead and pray, and then let's take a look at this great scripture in the book of Luke chapter 23, and we're going to read verses 44 all the way through 40 um, something else today, 48. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for those who are listening. I pray, Father, that we would grow close to you. I pray, Lord God, that we'd become the kind of people that you want us to be because we're hearing your voice, we're listening to you, and we're hearing your word. Lord, help us to see those things, Lord God, that you want us to be obedient to, the things that your Holy Spirit is leading us to see, to be changed and transformed and become more like Christ. And so, Lord God, fill us now with your Holy Spirit and give us the light of your word, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, good morning to your morning nine o'clock crowd that's um, watching this morning. And I am going to um, read this to you. And it says in Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 44, it says, Now it was about the sixth hour. We're going to talk about the sixth hour. And there was darkness over the earth until the ninth hour. And we're going to read about that as well. It says, Then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn to two. We're going to talk about this veil in the temple having been torn. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, we'll talk about that loud voice. And when Jesus cried out, he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Let's also speak of that. Having said this, he breathed his last, one of the final or the final saying of Christ. And then it says in verse 47 of Luke 23, it says, So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And we will see at the end of his life and how salvation was coming even right there on that cross. And verse 48, it says, And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts. So there were all these people in Jerusalem at the time, maybe some of those that were following, shouting Hosanna. And it says that they... And then it says, after they saw what had happened, and they returned, like they returned back home. But it gives the feeling there of brokenness and repentance and, and needing God. And it says, but all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. And I would hope that all of us today would not have to stand at a distance any longer. I pray that all of us could be brought near by the blood of Christ, that we would really find our full assurance of faith and hope in him. You see, Christians sometimes know and believe and, you know, that are going to heaven. They've asked Jesus into their heart, but they lack some reassurance. And so today, the things that we see through Jesus' death on the cross, I pray that your heart would be fully reassured before him. So we start off here with this study on darkness and death and repentance and entering in at verse 44. And it talks there about that sixth hour. And sometimes people want to know those kind of things. They have questions about the sixth hour. When is that? Well, there was a Roman way of telling time. And so some people would say, oh, well, that was at midnight. But then there was the Jewish way of telling time. And we know by the words of Jesus that he was going by the Jewish way of telling time. So, so would his disciples have. Because Jesus at one point had said in John chapter 11, verse 9, are there not 12 hours in a day? And their way of looking at time was sunrise to sunset was 12 hours. Are there not 12 hours in a day? And then, of course, there was a scripture in the book of Acts, chapter 23, verse 23, that said the third hour of the night which would have been nine o'clock in the evening. So we've got these way of looking at time. So what it puts us at then, as far as him dying on the cross and not the actual death, but it says that it was noon. And at noon, there was darkness that came across the earth as he was dying on the cross and it lasted for three hours. And so this darkness from noon onward, um, you can see that it wouldn't have been quite a a miracle or something from God if it happened at midnight. But of course, in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, the Bible also talks about Jesus when he went to the well, when he was tired and he was thirsty and the woman offered him, you know, something to drink. And so in that particular case, it also says it was a six hour. And we know that you're not going to be weary and thirsty at midnight like that. And so therefore it was, it was noon. 
And, and, but here he is on the cross. And this is a wearisome thing, like the, you know, going to the well at that sixth hour. And, and at this time, he is accomplishing the salvation of the world. And then you think, well, you know, why do we care about that exact hour? Why do we care about that time? Well, because it's the time that was calculated for our Lord being on the cross for those hours and what was going on on our behalf and the power of darkness having its time at this time to do its little thing as far as, um, you know, thinking that they have the victory, but Jesus is actually triumphing over them in this. And so it's this moment that he's making this great impact. It's this moment to which he came. And so it is becoming very clear who the people of darkness are, who the thinkers of darkness are, just like today. And you can see those that are thinking in the light and those that are thinking clearly and those that are thinking of God and those that might be the sons of the devil or unless there's somebody who's going to be saved. In Luke chapter 22, verse 53, we read the words of Jesus and he said, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Like God had given him into their hands and had allowed this darkness to come on the earth. And, and three hours, three hours on the earth. And it doesn't say on the land of Israel or on the land of Egypt, like in the Old Testament, where a judgment of God was darkness that came all across Egypt. And it says that it came across the land of Egypt. This one says it was darkness across the earth. And so we get the sense and the feeling here that this is worldwide, that people would have been going, hey, what's what's going on? Why did it all get dark? And it wasn't an eclipse. This was a plan of God that darkness just kind of crept in, whether it was um, the God of this world and, you know, a, a visibility of that darkness or whether it was the darkness of the heart of man being revealed. And this is what it looks like to be in deep and thick darkness that can be felt. And, and of course, the world being without Christ and the world being without God is already in utter darkness and they need a light to shine. And, and so it's interesting in the scripture because it also says um, in that story that there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened. You see, that's interesting because it was darkness first and then the sun was darkened second. Well, when we look at the creation account and God said in Genesis, let there be light, there was light first. And then God created after that on one of the days of creation, the sun, the moon, and the stars, those other lights, but light first. In this particular case, darkness first, and then the sun was covered. And so the Lord was just saying that all of my creation is in darkness. And, and we know that we're awaiting for that redemption of the body. We're waiting for that revealing of the sons of God. But until then, there's there's darkness over the face of the whole earth. You know, some of those arguments that people get into, was the flood of Noah a worldwide flood or was it a localized flood? Well, you know, the Bible teaches that it was across the world. And, and so in this particular case, I believe that to be the case, that it says, as it says, that literally that it happened across the earth. And, and so that would make sense because of the reality of men being in their darkness and being in their sin. But then somebody maybe with a scientific mind that has an unbelieving mind that doesn't know that Jesus can make water into wine will say, well, that didn't happen. That couldn't happen. But the same thing with the sundial in the book of Isaiah, when Ahaz um, saw that as a sign and Isaiah had the sundial go back 10 degrees and so basically stopped the sun, you know. And, and can God do that? Of course, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. They're all his mechanisms, and they were all created for man. So if God wants to do something for man through them, of course, certainly he can. And so so this darkness before the sun, before um, any actual physical darkness, and we know that that was the case because the darkness did start in heaven with the enemy, um, you know, the dragon pulling down a third of the stars and deceiving some of the angels of God. And so the darkness started before even God said, let there be um, light on the earth. And, and yet it was the Lord's light that lit the earth. And now at this time, it's the Lord's light that is being snuffed out. 
the light of the world himself is being turned off because men loved their darkness rather than the light and wouldn't come into the light so their evil deeds might be exposed. His own silver cord is being loosed. The book of Ecclesiastes talks about that when somebody dies. Um, so there's an eeriness at this moment as he's on the cross. There's a creepiness of darkness. And it's so thick. It's so real. It's so seeable and touchable that it could almost be cut through, that it could be felt. Um, like the presence of God sometimes. When you're worshiping or you're praying and, and you're in your room and you're just seeking God and the, and the power and the presence of God can be felt. Well, Jesus is still there in the midst of the darkness. Just like if I make my bed in the grave, even there you are. But this right here is not an improbability. This is a real thing happening, that God was in control of that day. God was in control of that sixth hour, that noon hour, where there couldn't be that kind of darkness. And if you're in a time of darkness in your life, if you're in a time of deep darkness and hurtful darkness in your life, well, I will tell you that none of us know what a day will bring forth. None of us know what a year will bring forth. But as we would sing a song or, or know that truth that, you know, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. And that's like Proverbs chapter 27, verse one, where it says, don't boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring forth. And a day could bring forth darkness. But our Jesus, the light of the world, is greater than any darkness. And even in the midst of darkness, he is saving souls. He saved our soul in the midst of darkness. You know, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the Antichrist kingdom and that it's pulled into darkness. I have all of those scriptures. I'll quote them to you later. Also, it talks about Pharaoh when, when um, Moses lifted up his hands and it says, then darkness came over the land of Egypt, that God removes the light because of judgment. He removed the light of the world and let things go dark because of his judgment. And so that's the way that the Lord works throughout the Bible. Um, if you see darkness outside, it's synonymous of the same thing that goes on inside the heart of man. Thank God that we sleep in the darkness and that we got to live our life during the times of day. And yet the people of the world, it says, do their deeds in darkness. And yet we need to come into the light as Christians and be doing our deeds in the light. Um, the Lord himself, it talks about him being shrouded in darkness. And those are some Old Testament and Psalm verses. But I will tell you now at this point, the cross and Jesus on the cross is shrouded in darkness. Everything that he had done in his ministry was done publicly and in the light. But now the act of salvation is being done in the cloak of darkness. It's like the womb. It's like being born out of darkness because the womb is that dark spot. And, and God brings a person out of that dark spot. They're being knit together in the darkness of their mother's womb. And then he brings them into the light. And so Jesus is saving souls and making new creations with the cross now being in that time of darkness. Exodus 10, 23, it says that all of the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. They had light in their dwellings when the land of Egypt was full of darkness. And so you would imagine there, you know, how did they see Jesus? Did they not run home? Why were all the people standing there when it was so dark that you couldn't even see your hand in front of you? Um, you know, they didn't have cell phones that, you know, could light up a little uh, flashlight at that moment. But I will tell you, I'm sure some people lit some lights there. Hey, what's going on? Where did all this darkness come from? The, the time in Egypt, though, only the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And that had to be a miracle, too, because how would these other people, their light, not work? In Second Peter chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, it says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. It's talking about, it's important that we take heed to God's word as a light that is shining in a dark place, in a dark world, until finally it dawns on us and the morning star, Jesus, shines forth in our hearts. Also, in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, that's where it says that men love darkness rather than the light because their days or, or because their deeds were evil. 
And then in Romans chapter 1, in verse 21, it talks about people who became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. That's what we don't want, is we don't want a dark heart. In 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 11 is a scripture where the prophet cried out to the Lord and God brought the shadow 10 degrees backwards. And that's that story that I quoted a little bit earlier. And then Revelation chapter 16 is a story about the Antichrist kingdom becoming full of darkness. And then in Jude, it actually talks about false teachers and such who are reserved for the blackness of darkness forever. And so when we speak of um, separation from God for eternity, sometimes it's spoken of as hellfire. Sometimes it's spoken of as um, eternal darkness. And in this particular case, um, you know, whatever that is, you just don't want it to be that time for your soul. But Jesus went through that time of darkness as he was dying on the cross. And he experienced the judgment of darkness and the forsakenness of darkness for each of us because we feel that and we've felt that. And he takes it upon himself for us because he loves you and me so much during our time of darkness in the world or our time of darkness because of suffering. But Jesus is still experiencing it for us. So that way we can trust in him. In um, Exodus chapter 10, verse 21 is a scripture where it says that it was darkness, which may even be felt. Now imagine as Moses stretched out his hands and God brought down a darkness, which could even be felt. And as Jesus' hands are now being stretched out and the whole world is filling a darkness which may even be felt. And then in Exodus chapter 10, it mentions that it was thick darkness in all of the land of Egypt. Now that's comparative to this darkness of judgment that's coming and surrounding Jesus Christ at this moment. In Isaiah chapter 60, it says, Arise and shine for your light has come. That's Isaiah 60, verse 1, and Jesus is that light that has come. It says, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And then verse 2, it says, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people, but the darkness will arise. One second. Okay. Stay over here, Petey. Okay. Sorry, you guys had to get up because there could be a coyote that um, you guys can see in the background, um, but that it would try to get my dog. And he only whines like that when it's a coyote, I think. So let's see. Okay. Shh, shh, shh. It's okay. Okay. There we go. And I'm um, here. Um, I'll put you on my on my lap. That's what I'm going to do. Put him on my lap. Okay. Uh, here we go. Come on, Pete. There. Okay. See the guy who um, barked right there. Okay. So it says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. And that's something that I love too, is that the Lord is bigger and greater and stronger than the darkness. His light is stronger than the darkness and that he will arise over us and his glory will be seen upon you. And the Gentiles, talking about the world, will shall come to your light. It's a prophecy of Jesus. And that's a, that's a pretty cool thing there and that um, we're going to radiate his light and so we've got to come out of our time of darkness. We've got to come to the cross, um, which is the light in the darkness, which um, creates treasures out of darkness, which Jesus was the treasure out of darkness, and we are his treasures out of darkness. And then um, I, I know that when we do follow the Lord and we get him in our hearts, he does radiate his light upon us. Even in our eyes, there could be a sparkle of the love of Jesus. And, and then a few hours later, at, at, it's believed to be three o'clock, you know, Jesus is hanging on that cross and he breathes his last. And that particular time when he breathed his last, he made his final statement. And that final statement, of course, was, um, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And, and so the, the darkness of the world didn't comprehend the light. But Jesus knew where he came from and he knew where he was going and he was able to commit himself into the hands of the Father. Um, you know, one year ago on June 24th, almost a year ago for me um, and my children, you know, my wife, we watched her on my bed breathe her last before the Lord. Mary, the mother of Jesus, watching her son breathe his last. Some of you have gone through that as well. And, and, and how his friends, even Peter and John, must have felt. How Maureen's friend, Andrea or Susanna or 
um, you know, any of the friends that were, you know, coming through here may have felt. And, and here it happened. It, Jesus died on the cross. And there it happened on my bed. I, I, I looked at my wife afterwards and I go, wow, you finally did it. We talked about it. You said you would. We knew it was going to happen. Now here it is. And there it is, the commander in chief of the Lord's army, breathing his last, hanging on the cross. And here it is, the wife of my heart and the mother of my children, bring, breathing her last. How do we come to such a time? Is it just empty? Is there a purpose? Does God have a plan in such a time? And yes, the answer is yes. A resounding yes, the answer is yes. That this is the tragicness of the moment. And yet, of the moment, it's still the will and the purpose of God. Just like Jesus wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. Oh, he knew that he was going to resurrect him, but it was still the sadness of death because death is an enemy. And yes, Jesus here was tasting death for all of us. But at the hour of death, whether it be Jesus's death or whether it be your death and the way your family talks about you, we don't have to get all doctrinal or all encouraging at that moment, because at that moment, we just need to take it in. At that moment, we just need to live the reality. My Savior just died on a cross. My wife just died on a bed. Um, you know, we like nice words, and we even like people's doctrinal surmisings, but not at that moment. That at that moment, we just need to contemplate and feel what happened. Maybe even for that week or two weeks, we need to just take it in because that person just breathed their last and it's hitting us and it's hitting us really, really hard. Um, and, and maybe at that moment, we don't have to know things will get better. I mean, look at all the darknesses that's around. Are things really going to get better? Um, but the fullness of life does come because Jesus promises it. And the reality of death does come because it's spoken about, but Jesus conquers that enemy. And so one day, just as He's having victory on the cross, so it doesn't look like it. He will have victory in our lives as well. The last enemy to be put under his feet is death. But for now, he's just tasting it for us. He's being the forerunner. He's dying on a cross. And this must have been hard for the light of the world who never sinned to take the sins of the world upon himself and to have died, to feel the darkness, to feel the forsakenness, prior to that, to feel the stress of it and to sweat the drops of blood leading up to it. And so all of that darkness outside, yes, all of that darkness outside was deeply a dark time within. And it seemed like the darkness had taken over because there was so much of it. But what Jesus was doing on that cross was so much more powerful than the darkness outside. And so sometimes the darkness does seem like it has won, like it has just destroyed us. Like we've, you know, been down and, and we're going to breathe our last. We, we feel like that because it feels like life is over. And all this past year, I mean, I was thinking about it with my um, having fallen on September 22nd, 7th, and then having had the surgery in the middle of October of the three bones that were broken in my foot and leg and the screws that were put in and the eight weeks, I guess, something like that of bedtime and keep my foot propped up, it was just really, really, really hard because I'm a person that you can't confine so easily. But imagine the confining of going through the death of a loved one, which many of you have, and it's something that you can't get out of. And it, it doesn't just take six to eight weeks of bedriddenness. It, it takes a year and two years of, you know, just really contemplating it and situating it and compartmentalizing it and handing it over and, and going through all of your changes and your ups and downs and how that has related to you and what it means to you. And, but ultimately the dark side doesn't win. The darkness does dissipate and the light of his glory does shine forth once again, even in your heart and lift you up and make you to shine. But Jesus bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. Such a heavy moment. And even the father himself felt it for sure. My dog, he's so funny. He just doesn't understand Bible studies and he wants to pull this little microphone off of me. So this, this darkness that we're talking about is heavy. 
but God is heavier. The glory of God, which means heavy. The glory of God is heavier than that. And so apart from apart from Jesus in this particular instance, there is, oh, I'm sorry, apart from Jesus going to Abraham's bosom, because that's where he went. And you could just say, oh, but he went to Abraham's bosom. And you want to immediately go on to the second part of the story that you know. But yeah, he did go there and he did do something there. But at that very moment, it was the reality of, wow, the Messiah just died on a cross. And, and because we don't see into the spiritual realm and we didn't see him enter into paradise, all you're seeing is him on that cross. And so we believe the future of what God says will happen to a soul after it dies, but we're still deeply moved and affected by what we see down here and by what we experience, the ugliness and the separateness that death creates. In verse 46 of Luke 23, it says, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. He cried out with a loud voice for everyone to hear. It was the most powerful moment on earth since the creation of the world. Because the creation of the world, there was the Big Bang, right? God said, let there be light. It just didn't happen over millions of years. It happened in the literal days that God said it happened because God is God. And so God said at that moment, and it impacted all of our futures. And now Jesus said, who is God the Son, on the cross. He says different words at you know, like the seven sayings of Jesus, but this last one, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. So this was a very big word of Jesus, a very powerful word of Jesus. The son who was sent by the father now coming back to the father. You know, I, I heard um, in the gym, somebody saying from across the locker room, Oh, father, oh, father. Like somebody would be praying, oh, Father, I'm going, okay, who is praying, oh, Father, oh, Father in here? So I go over to the other side of the lockers, and I see this older gentleman, probably in his 80s, and I said, you're praying out loud, oh, Father, oh, Father, like I wanted to understand. And he said, no, I'm not. And I realized that that wasn't his voice. It was coming from somewhere else. He says, but the book of John chapter 14 is a great chapter and talks about the Holy Spirit. And he explains some things about the Holy Spirit in our lives and guiding. And he said, so you need to read that. And so I go, okay, I don't know who said, oh, Father, oh, Father, but this um, older gentleman here um, definitely had um, a word to give. And and then um, when I, after I had gotten done working out with Pastor Sean and I go over to um, go to the pool and I see him walk past me to the pool. And then I look and later I don't see him, he's not there. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, was he an angel? And then I went back looking for him later and he was there, you know, because I want to know, did I really see an angel? But um, but it doesn't matter whether it was or not. He was still God's messenger to send John chapter 14 when I thought I heard somebody praying, which I'm sure somebody was. Um, but, you know, God uses natural phenomena, natural situations that we're in, our normal life, and he, he brings light into darkness. He brings light into our lives. And, and so praise the Lord for that. And so here's the final saying of Jesus, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's delivering himself up, not into the hands of men, because that was hurtful, that put him on the cross, but he's delivering himself up into the hands of the Father, into the comforting hands, into the eternal hands, into the secure hands, which no one is going to pluck him out, and no one will pluck us out, because we're in his hands. He's got the whole world, but of course, the believing world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother and sister, in his hands. And what better words of confidence could Jesus even speak at that moment? Then I'm coming to you, Father, and it's into your hands that I'm committing my spirit. You and I, when we die, we commit our soul to a faithful creator. We commit our soul to the hands of the shepherd. And it could be today. It could be tomorrow. We don't know, but we commit it to him. But we got to commit it to him today in being born again and asking Jesus into our heart before it will actually be able to be committed to him the next day. 
And so we don't know the timing that Jesus is coming. But if he was coming today, you would say, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. And then it says, I will strengthen you. And it says, um, for I am your God. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Hey, what better thing could there ever be than to be in the hand of God in life or in death? Absolutely, right? Agreement? And it says in 1 Peter 4, 19, it says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. And that would be like if you were a martyr and you just commit yourself to him. And in John chapter 13, verse 3, it says, Jesus, knowing the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had he had come from God and was going to God. And that's that's the confidence level that he had at this moment. And then it mentions one more thing, that the veil of the temple was torn in two at the moment that he died. And the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, it had a veil that separated the holy place that the priest could go only into once a year and do the sprinkling of blood on the Ark of the Covenant and um, you know the, the, the seat of, the, um, of that Ark. And even though whether, you know, at the time said it was actually there, but it represented the presence of God and the blood of Christ in entering in to the holiest of all, the place of worship, the place of seeking God. And so at this place, God tears this very thick veil in two from top to bottom. And, and God is able to do that to make people, the two, become one. That, that Jew and Gentile through Christ and through the blood of Christ becoming one because he himself was torn and he himself was broken for our sins. And, you know, I could tell stories um, from the Old Testament about the veil and more information on that. The book of Hebrews also talks about it, which I have a few verses there. And I could tell you about how when we went into our, our building and took it over as our own, that there was a, in our gymnasium, which was now our sanctuary, there was a big, huge vinyl curtain that you can make two basketball courts. And it was torn from top to bottom when we took it over. And it was like, everybody's going, whoa, this was very interesting. Like the Lord is saying, I have given access to you. I have created a way for you to come into this place. And so the truth is, is that the Lord is our way. And the fact is that we can go to that throne of grace because of his blood. We've got an entrance a grand entrance, a freely given entrance into the place where there's friendship with God, where we meet with God face to face. And so may we enter in by the blood of the Lamb. May we enter in to the Holy of Holies, that his flesh was torn, but not a bone was broken according to prophecy. And like Abraham's sacrifice, that the Spirit of God went between the two pieces that were cut, so the Lord was there and the spirit of God was there in that sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. Um, like the Red Sea was split in two and the people of God passed through. And so um, whether it's the spirit of the Lord passing through or the people of God passing through, we all through the blood of Christ can now enter in to the presence of God. In John 19, 36, it says, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And yet we got to always remember that his flesh was torn. And when we take communion, we do this in remembrance of him. And there's no more veil that is needed any longer because sinners are not separated from a holy God in the same way that they once were, that God has given free access through the blood of Christ. And there's not a priest needed to go in there once a year for Jesus, the high priest of all time, has gone in there once and for all for us as he died for our sins. And so the open door, to the presence of God is an open invitation to go directly to him. Not that we need some priest to pray for us, but we need the invitation of God to say, come and drink freely of the waters that I will give you, the waters of salvation, the waters of eternal life. He's given us access. He's given us the backstage pass to a relationship with God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7, it says, but into the second part of the 
um, the high priest, second part of the temple, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins, committed in ignorance. So he would go behind the veil and offer an offering for himself and the people. And the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So there was a plan that people would go in, but not yet. And then in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, because we can enter in. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, it talks about us having boldness through the blood of Christ. And in verse 20, it says that we get this new and this living way that he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. It says, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And praise God for the washing that he's done and for the cleansing that he's done over us. And then in Hebrews 9, 14, um, if you take note and Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, all of those are great scriptures about the topic. And then, of course, we have to always remember when he had communion with his disciples and he broke the bread, that's his body, that's his flesh, that's the veil. And he says, take and eat, this is my body, and it's broken for you. The break is so that way you can enter in. And then in Revelation 21, um, he says, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I'm going to give you of the fountain of the water of life to him who thirsts. So if you're thirsting, Take that invitation. Take it freely to enter into that throne of God's unmerited, undeserved, unearned grace that's shed for you. Luke 23, 47, it says, So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, This was a righteous man. In the midst of the darkness dissipating, and at the end of the mocking and the diabolical thing that was going on, Things had now quieted down, and one of the guards standing there at the cross has a recognition that this was a righteous man, because who hears anybody dying and saying, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. That's where honesty comes out of who you are, definitely, right there at that moment. Do you know Jesus or not? And 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 there's not too many righteous men, so this man could recognize that Jesus was different than all the rest. And so he acknowledged this about him. He noticed the way Jesus died, you know, as even one criminal there was, was cursing and, and mocking. Um, but Jesus himself was not reviling. And so the soldier, the centurion, saw it. And so in the midst of Jesus dying, and in the midst of the light now appearing in the darkness, this man is seeing the light. Now, some people remain in their darkness, and Jesus said in Matthew 6, 23, if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? But I will tell you that Jesus can uproot the greatest darkness from anybody's life if they come to the cross like that centurion did. And so this man is definitely not noticing the darkness anymore. He's seeing the light of Jesus. The, the darkness has now given way to a glimpse of who Jesus was and that man was seeing, just like the other thief was recognizing who Jesus was. And people do, when they look at the cross, begin to recognize exactly who Jesus was. Pilate and Herod, they had to have thought it was odd that it became dark at that moment of Jesus' crucifixion. But the problem is, people have signs, but they disregard the signs that they see and they pay no attention to even obvious signs, even the obvious signs of the days that we are living in with the coming of Jesus. And in Proverbs 4, verse 19, it says that the way of, wick, of the wicked is deep darkness. And they don't know what makes them stumble because they don't even understand that they're in darkness. And the world is blinded by the God of this world. But yet we are given eyes to see by the light of this world. God reveals the deep things that he's doing and, and the deep things that we can't see through Christ who shines his light in our hearts. He enlightens our darkness and his word, even today's word that you're hearing, enlightens your darkness. So look to the cross and you will see the light of Jesus. And when I say that, I'm talking about the story and the work that he did for the salvation of the world. In Luke chapter 23, verse 48, it says, And the whole crowd 
who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. And the idea of smoting your breath, alarm, astonishment, fear, dread, confusion, anguish, conscious of their own guilt, repentance. Well, they're seeing either the judgment of God or what they think is guilty rulers in the judgment of man. And they're knowing that Jesus was a righteous man. And then they're maybe thinking, if a righteous man dies, who is honest and sincere and good, then what will come of me? Where shall I stand? What will come of us? Is God's displeasure upon the whole world? And then it says that they returned. Well, you know what they returned and did from what the, the emphasis seems to show me is that they're saying, oh God, they went back and they knelt down and they prostrated themselves to the ground, even though it doesn't say that specifically, but it gives you the picture of beating the breast is a place of repentance. Like it says in Luke chapter 18, verse 13, about the tax collector standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I tell you that that man went to his house justified. So he returned to his home. These people returned to their homes because they beat their breast. And, and for us, sometimes we will have that recognition of who Jesus is, like those people and like that man. And are, are you drawn to the cross? You know, multitudes are drawn to the cross because it's the best story ever told. The Bible teaches it being a point of decision like that centurion had to make or like those crowds who beat their breast had to make. Or like in verse 49, it goes on to say, and it's the final verse there that we're reading today in Luke chapter 23, it says, but all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. And my question is, as I understand why they were, at, they were at a distance that day, but are we going to stay at a distance from this righteous man, from this savior of the world, from this God become flesh? Are we going to remain at a distance? Or are we going to draw near stepping out of the multitudes and the world who maybe is going on the pathway to destruction? And, and come out from among them and be separate and say, hey, I'm raising my hand. Jesus is my way. He's the way out of darkness. And at the cross is where we first see the light. According to Joel chapter 3, verse 14, and this is our closing verse right now, okay? Joel chapter 3, verse 14, it says, Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark. And the stars will diminish their brightness. And the Lord also is going to roar from Zion, as Jesus did shout and say, Father, into your hands and commit my spirit. And he's going to utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake. And there was a shaking. There was an earthquake that day. It says, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And praise God for that. You and myself have made that decision. Let's never go back on that decision. And if you happen to be watching this today and you haven't made that decision, make the decision to tell the Lord, Lord, I believe you died for me and I believe you rose from the dead. And I'll tell you what, if you really believe that and you give your heart to Jesus and you hand your sins over to him, you shall be saved. All right, you guys, God bless you. May you have a great day. I'm gonna say a prayer now. And we have a 10 o'clock service at church today, um, a five o'clock one as well. The 10 o'clock one I'll be teaching, um, Lord willing, if we're all here. Um, but anyway, so Lord, just um, bless your people who've watched today. Bless this message. Send it out. I pray that people would share this message on their on their YouTube play, um, pages or Facebook pages and all, just wherever they can share it, Lord God. Because Lord, this is an important message of eternal life for those that will hear it. And so Lord, bless those that have heard. And, and I pray, Lord, for eternal life if anybody needs to receive you into their heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys. God bless you. Be at peace. All right, because the darkness is going away and his light is shining.